Uh, my name is Stacy Krim, and I am talking with William Sutherland. Today is March 8th, 2019. We are in the Parish Library of the Alumni House. Um, I am also here with David Gwynn. Thank you for talking to us today. It's my pleasure. All right. Um, so, Will, can you? Uh, were you a native of Greensboro? No. Okay. Um, I was a military brat. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I was born in Georgia. Uh -huh. um, we, I was born in uh, Smyrna, actually, of all places, just outside of Atlanta. Uh, my grandmother lived there for a long time. Uh, my parents were very young. They were actually still in college. Um, and then after a couple of years, we moved around a lot. My, uh, my parents finished up school. My dad joined the Air Force. Um, so pretty quickly we moved to Tennessee and then Texas and then Arizona, Mississippi, Arkansas. Uh, eventually got to North Carolina. We got to North Carolina by fourth grade and then I went to boarding school for a long time uh, I went to a boy choir school which is how I got sucked into this whole choir lifestyle uh, and then I did come back to North Carolina to go to high school and then I went to Florida State to do my undergraduate degree and then um, did come back to UNCG to do my master's degree and that was about 10 years ago okay. um, so Certainly by no means a native to Greensboro, but I've been around mm -hmm. now for about 15 years, mm -hmm. sort of like intermittently. Mm -hmm. so. wow. And what was your music focus for your master's? Choral conducting. Choral conducting. Yeah, okay. I've studied with, with Bill Young at UNC Greensboro. Okay, excellent. Um, and did you go into music knowing you were definitely going to do choral conducting? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. It's a story that I've never told, but it's a story that I think is is really meaningful to how I got here. When I was a kid and I was in this boy choir school, we would do um, we would get to do some conducting every once in a while. And at the eighth graders at the end of the year, they would have students basically apply, um, you know, sort of throw their hat in to conduct at the last concert. And I really wanted to do it. And I'd actually taken the piece that we were doing. We were a group that had sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses. Even though we were middle school, we had all four parts. This particular piece didn't. It, I think it was like two part or whatever. So I had rewritten the ending so that it was all four part. I had done this whole thing. And then we got to the day and I did the conducting and they definitely picked the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, it's basically been like, my life's focus to fix that. No. Um, so, yeah. So I, since that, ever since then, um, when I was in high school, I started the choir program at my school. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have one. Mm -hmm. um, so I um, just got a bunch of friends together after school. Mm -hmm. And a couple of probably pirated copies of <laughs> sheet music. And, <laughs> you know, we did what we could. Um, we did one little concert. Mm -hmm. We did a Lessons of Carols. It was my my junior year uh, and it turned out it was good it was fun everybody mm -hmm. liked it um, they actually wound up hiring a choir teacher the next year um, which kind of annoyed me why didn't they just hire me right. uh, <laughs> so and what else I was um, I was in the praise band at my church growing up um, we actually were one of the few Catholic churches that had moved in that direction um, through this program that came out of Arizona called uh, Life Teen mm -hmm. um, and so I sang in that band, and because I played keyboard, I got to be, um, like, the... I was never really officially the assistant director, but I would run rehearsals when he wasn't there, and then eventually, by the time I was, like, a senior, um, he was letting me run worship services when he wasn't there and stuff like that. Uh, so I actually wound up doing that in college, too, because um, it's, it's a great way to make money. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that in undergrad. Uh, as well, and that was when I kind of shifted from, it was kind of a band-ish kind of thing, but I had a keyboard player, so I could wave my hands. Um, so it was more of a conducting situation. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, everything just kind of fit neatly together in sort of a straight line. So what is it about conducting that just drew you in? Yeah, you know, that's such an interesting question. And and actually, a project that I'm working on right now, I'm actually asking conductors, as part of a research project, the exact same question. So I'm not sure if I've thought about it for myself. Um, 
I've always had a really strong visceral feeling for what the music should sound like, honestly, is what it is. It's never really been so much about... It's never been about that weird word called power. It's never been about that, or control. It's just... I just feel really strongly what the music should sound like. And... I'm pretty good at communicating that to people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know what the end result should be. That's that's what it is. Okay. And uh, when did you start the your master's program here at UNCG? So I graduated from Florida State in 2006, mm -hmm. and I went into my master's straight away. Mm -hmm. So it was fall of 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and then that was two years. Okay. Master's degrees are quick yeah. compared to... You know, doctorates. <laughs> so um, that was 2006, and I finished up in 2008. Uh -huh. And then 2008, I left, and uh, there was a financial crisis. I don't remember. I don't know if you remember, but um, anyway, getting a job in 2008 was almost impossible. Um, and I got lucky, and it was a it was a tough circumstance. But um, I got a job at a uh, downtown school in Richmond, Virginia. Um, which was, it was a really tough circumstance, um, but it was a really good circumstance for me. So, um, Title I school, 93% uh, of the students were on free and reduced price lunch. Um, it was, it was an interesting circumstance, and I, uh, I was there for almost five years, mm -hmm. which is actually to my credit, it'll cut a bit longer than a lot of, a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. By my third year, the other teachers didn't really talk to me a whole lot the first couple of years. By my third year, they were like, oh, well, I guess they're not going to chase you off then. They meant the kids. Um, and they started letting me know, like, like, we would always have this bet at the beginning of the year, which of the new teachers would actually make it to the end of the year, because it was not even most of them. Um, but it was good. I mean, it was my chance to, to finally do that thing that I had trained for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got the kids together, but yeah, I'd take them to contest. We'd have 80 kids on stage and we'd get superior ratings at festivals and, um, you know, we'd pack the house with the student performances uh, for parents, for parent-teacher night and stuff like that. Um, and I had to, you know, break up fights about once a week, um, but yeah, it all just kind of was all there. And then I left there and I came here. I eventually had just, I, I, I just couldn't. It was taking too much of my emotional energy to stay there. So I eventually um, took a job. My mom is a music director. I'm actually a second generation conductor, which is funny. My mom is a conductor at a church in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and what else? So she had found it. There was a, there was a Catholic school in Raleigh that was looking for a music teacher. Their teacher had left um, at Thanksgiving, hmm. um, which was actually interesting because that was the year that I had, I had decided that I needed to look for something else. Um, so I was able to come into that school at Christmas, which is an interesting transition, um, but it was good. Um, and that was when I started a different type of job. So in that job, it was general music. Actually, it, was, it started off as all general music but it was third through eighth grade. And I had been teaching middle school, so that seemed like a natural fit. Um, come to find out, I was not really ready for that. Um, teaching general music is a very different experience. Um, but I usually do pretty well in circumstances like that, so I figured it out. And I actually discovered that I kind of fell in love with, especially teaching elementary school. Uh, I find those kids really fun. And they found out that, you know, Choral music is sort of like a deep-seated passion of mine, so they were willing to make some adjustments, and they did allow me to have some choir classes for the middle school students later, and um, I started an after-school group. We, we got played on uh, the radio every year. Mix 101.5 does this fun uh, Christmas competition, so we'd send in our recordings, and they'd play us on the, on the air, and uh, so that was fun. And then... It was actually during that time that I started, and this is, I don't know where wh what your thoughts are, but this is a great dovetail because that's when I started uh, working with the chorus. 
um, there was a an advertisement that they had posted on ACDA. Um, the American Choral Directors Association has a website that hosts a listserv um, called CoralNet, and um, the choir had uh, posted an ad on CoralNet for an artistic director. And, and this is the Triad Men's Pride That's Chorus. right, yeah. So Triad Pride Men's Chorus was the organization that started here um, in Greensboro. And so in 2013, I applied for the artistic director position there. They had been without an artistic director for about six months. Um, there had been, unfortunately, the way the story has been told to me, a bit of a falling out that had been going on for a couple of years, actually. Um, so I think they were very happy to, to get a hold of me. Um, and it was a commute for me, because I was living in Durham at the time. So I was commuting an hour, but once or twice a week, it's not a big deal. Um, so it was good. It was, it was nice to sort of have a... It was nice to have a situation where I felt like I was actually using, like really using my skill set. Mm -hmm. um, so that was fun. So I have to ask, you're, mm -hmm. you're teaching at a Catholic school, mm -hmm. and then you are now heading a gay men's chorus. Yeah. Was there any conflict or any worry that you would not, that there would be a threat to your job? That is an excellent question. Um, and I actually have two answers to that. Okay. The first is I wasn't really worried partly because of geography. Truthfully, nobody at the school ever even found out. Um, it's not, but that leads me to say, but they wouldn't have cared. So, like, it wasn't really on their radar. People were just separated enough. But <clears throat> um, the Franciscan school uh, and St. Francis, the parish that's there, um, are actually run by Franciscans. And for those that are familiar with the Franciscan ethos, um, the Franciscan community tends to be very, very supportive of LGBTQ people. Um, so, in fact, that parish... Uh, has an active uh, LGBTQ ministry um, and outreach uh, programs and has uh, specific non-discrimination written into their policies. Mm -hmm. So, no, I felt very comfortable. Um, in fact, many of the students were actually aware of my sexuality simply because they would ask, mm -hmm. and it was never an issue. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so the previous artistic director mm -hmm. and you're going in, were you also the conductor going in? Yes. So, okay. Yep. Was, was the previous professionally trained or were you the first professionally trained? Um, no, I believe he was. Okay. Um, he had actually worked, um, as the, uh, assistant director of the Burlington Boy Choir for a while, okay. um, and was a church musician. Um, yeah, my understanding is... You know, he was a good artistic director. The big difference, the, 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 my understanding of the story, the way that it happened was that the previous artistic director simply wanted to do music that the group wasn't interested in. Um, he wow, actually programmed like quite a bit of Mozart, quite a bit of older music. We've started calling it formal music because it's not all classical, right? Per se. Um, and that wasn't what the group wanted to do. The group wanted to do more fun stuff, pop stuff, upbeat stuff. And so um, it it caused a good deal of, of frustration. And there were apparently some very heated board meetings um, where they were sort of hashing out those responsibilities and um, there was a committee formed to pick music because they were just so frustrated with the music selections. Um, and then that was another thing that sort of added to the frustration because the previous artistic director didn't want to participate in that kind of a system. So it was definitely, it was a little messy when I walked in. People were a little on edge. So it, it required a lot of politics at first. What was the interview <clears throat> process like? Interview process was interesting. Gosh, I'm trying to think how much of this I can actually remember. It's been so long since I thought about it. We met together at least a couple of times. Um, once just casually. Um, 
Robert Jordan was the chair of the board at that time. Um, and he was the one who was the principal communicator with me and who was the one that was sort of walking me through the interview process. Um, once with him, just informally, uh, and then once with the board, and then once with the chorus, because they obviously they had me come in and do sort of an audition, a formal audition, um, where I rehearsed the group. Um, so it was a few times. Mm -hmm. Um, what I do remember, though, actually, was that the biggest um, back and forth was about the contract. Because as a nonprofit, um, they don't really have a lot of people with specific professional skill sets like contract writing. Um, so they sent me <clears throat> what was the contract, but which was very, very short. It was basically just like, you will be artistic director, we will pay you this much money, and then sign at the bottom. And then another document that was called the job description, which must have been four pages long of just like bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, single spaced <laughs> back and front. Um, and I looked at that and I was like, no, I am not going to get myself into a situation. So I actually wound up writing my own contract. <laughs> <laughs> I took their job description. I merged it into a contract format. And then I literally just took out the things I didn't want to do or didn't think was was reasonable. I, I actually did see in some ways you could see the trauma in this document of the things that had gone wrong that they were explicitly trying to like write into ways to fix um, and it would not have been productive. So I remember Robert actually has told me since. He said you know there was a moment where we weren't even going to hire you because we thought you were a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah so we went back and forth on that for like a month and then the contract that I finally wound up with was like 16 pages long but it stipulated every single thing and so and this is where I feel strongly like that first year that I worked um, it was really easy because I knew exactly what I needed to do and they knew what I was going to do everybody was on the same page so I was very very happy that they allowed us to have that conversation back and forth for a while even if it was frustrating because in the end the transition wound up going well because I understood the expectations and so did they mm -hmm. so so you had had a lot of experience uh, conducting youth groups mm -hmm. um, how much experience had you had conducting um, adults go as you were going in so I had had experience conducting young adults when I was working with the college students and undergrad, and I'd had a little bit of experience conducting older, right, so like middle-aged adults when I was in high school, but both of those were very sheltered experiences. I wasn't actually the one in charge or, you know, there was a lot of other people around to, to give me support. Um, this was definitely the first time I've ever, I had ever conducted adults in this way as the full-time director is with nobody else to help me out. Um, it's a very different experience. Uh, it is a very different experience. I thought trying to wrangle children was like herding cats. No, at least the children all know the direction you want them to go. Adults don't always know the direction you want them to go. Um, it's, it's been, it continues to be, there continue to be challenges that we're, we're trying to address and, and problem solve for. So people are busy, right? I mean, that's the first one that I noticed. Towards the middle of the semester, and we work from August till December, we'll do a concert in December, and then we work again from January to May and do a concert in May. So we usually talk about our programming season in terms of semesters. And I remember the first semester, we got about halfway, th we got halfway in, it was like end of October, which to me is the time where like, we really need to start buckling down and getting things, you know, really ready because we've got a concert in a few weeks. And I come into rehearsal and there'd be half the people there because people have conflicts and everybody's an adult. So you can't penalize people in the same way that you can a student. There are no grades, right? There's no... I don't have any, the only carrot I have is music and I don't have any sticks. So 
I actually I love this this analogy. Apparently, or at least the way the story was told to me, George Washington once complained that when leading the Revolutionary Army, every morning he'd have to wake up and convince the soldiers that it was the right thing to do every single day. That is often how I feel. Every day I have to get up in front of that group and when we're in rehearsal and I have to convince them that it's worth it. All that hard work is worth it. Um, Because it is. It's a lot of hard work. It amazes me um, how much. And we'll get into that later, I think, but, um, you know, that's my dissertation is actually why do they do the hard work? Um, Because because it is. Between the amount of rehearsal that they sit in, the amount of rehearsing they do on their own, the amount of money some of these people contribute. I mean, I draw a salary from the organization, and that is raised through fundraising, and a lot of the donors um, are my singers. So... It must be worth it to them if they're willing right. to, you know, chip in that much. And uh, how many? Let's talk a bit about the 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 size and sure. the makeup of the chorus before we get into the yeah. the juicy details. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, let's start with the men's chorus. Sure. Um, uh, when did that start, and how big is that chorus? So Tri Pride Men's Chorus was founded by the way I remember the story by four members who had been singing with the Triangle Gay Men's Chorus. So the Triangle Gay Men's Chorus has been around a little while longer. Um, and then in 1998, they began the planning processes. They, they just felt like driving all the time. They didn't need to. They could just start a group in Greensboro. Greensboro and Raleigh, I do think, are separated enough that we don't do a lot of overlap. Um, so in 1998, they started the process of creating this organization. And so they um, incorporated, um, you know, created the, established the 501c3. Um, and then in 99 was when they had their first concert, spring of 99. So planning started in fall of 98, and then they actually did their first concert in spring of 99. Um, and they had like, they had like a dozen people back then. Um, and then it's just shifted, you know, when I look through the, um, spreadsheet with the numbers, um, it's up and down. There was a time, I think it was either 2000, I think it might've been 2012 or maybe it was 2011. They did, this is before me, they did a seventies themed, uh, concert that was super popular. And apparently that concert, for some reason, they got up to almost 40 singers that, that time. Um, a huge packed house. Um, and we've never been back up there again. Um, so we've been really kind of struggling to keep, we're usually above 20, um, but it's usually right on it. Sometimes it's 19, sometimes it's 22. Uh, I don't know. It's been, it's been tough to get the word out. Um, it's also been tough. People are just not really People in general are hesitant to commit to things, is what I found. So they're happy to say they're supportive, and they are, and they come to our shows and things like that. Um, but it's been difficult to convince people to come once a week. So, uh, so yeah, about twenty-two. And uh, the women? Oh, well, the women! We can't keep people away. <laughs> um, so the women's chorus was a new venture for us. Um, when I came in. In 2013, it was sort of right at the beginning of some of the big social change that we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, so right, so in 2013, I didn't really think a thing about it. Um, but then into 15, and we'd, we we're having the starts of these, you know, very challenging presidential election, and then sort of seeing where things were developing. It became very clear um, that women in general we're not having access to or provided with a platform in the same way that men were. And so uh, we had always talked about starting a women's chorus and I just thought, well, this is absolutely the right time. Um, and then also I was moving, I was starting my degree here at UNCG. So um, I was moving from Durham to Greensboro. So I had some more time. I wouldn't have to commute. So I said, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's finally, you know, get this group started. Um, 
so we had a couple of interest meetings. Um, we had several very enthusiastic people right off the bat. Um, in fact, from our first interest meeting, we were able to elect a president and a vice president to help us get us off the ground. Um, and then that first semester we had, if I remember the exact number, I think it was 20, 22 or 23. And then that was the spring of 2017. And then fall of 18, we had like 28 or 29. And then spring of, was it fall of 18? No, fall of 18, we had like 32. And then spring of 19, we've had I think we've got 43 now. So, and we're comparing ourselves to other choruses. We think that ensemble will probably, based on the size of our region, um, probably cap out around 50 or 60, just based on what other groups in other places look like. Mm -hmm. But there's no way to know. Wow. They sing really well. Uh, we've been getting members who sing with all of the top groups. We've been getting Bel Canto members coming to sing with us. Um, people with really high level skills. Um, the president elect of NCA CDA is singing with us, um, which is actually great, which is actually great for me because as I'm conducting and one, you know, when you've done a job for a long time, you kind of just get into these routines, but now I'll be conducting and I'll look over and go, Oh, okay. What are you doing? Conduct really well. <laughs> are you doing it right? <laughs> so, so who's allowed to become a member? Of anybody. The anybody and this has been an issue in the um gala chorus movement so gala originally gala actually stood for much like npr used to stand for national public radio gala used to stand for gay and lesbian association of choruses and they've actually since abandoned that name and um have adopted only gala uh, as their name uh which i think is actually valuable because you know as the as society continues to more openly acknowledge and respect and, and accept gay and lesbian people, we're seeing a much more diverse group of people in our ensembles. So whereas probably if you'd asked me in 2013 for the Triad Pride Men's Chorus, like who can be in this group, I would say, well, it's a group for gay men and their allies, right? Always, you know, we always wanna be, be open to that. Now we don't even say that anymore. Now it's for anybody that wants to sing tenor and bass, and for the um, for the women's chorus, it's anybody that wants to sing soprano and alto. Um, and there may come a time when it's appropriate for us to actually change the names altogether, um, because identifying these ensembles by gender, I mean, it's tough to say. Because on the one hand, identifying the men's chorus by gender doesn't really add anything. I don't know. Maybe identifying the women's chorus by gender does add something um, because of the importance of representation for women in our society, especially right now. It's hard to say. I work on a committee for uh, GALA that actually is talking about these questions about issues of um, access and, and equity to access for all kinds of different people um, and creating spaces where, for example, you know, trans people who may sing tenor or bass, who have a female gender identity, um, where, where do they get to go? Who, wh what, what group do they get to be in? Um, and so I think it's, an, it's critical if we're going to be supportive of those people that we provide spaces where they feel like they can also belong. Um, and so that's why it was so important to me. You know, our, our men's course now, by the way, our men's course has, um, you know, as far as I understand, two or three cisgendered women who sing tenor now, uh, who just love the group and just want to be there um, and love the music that we do. So, um, you know, creating a space that's open for everybody is important, but that name is always kind of a, a bit of a sticking point. So we'll see where that goes. It could just be that that's the history, right? That that's the legacy name that gets us you know, it's got the brand recognition and it's, it, it's where we come from. I mean, certainly, you know, hopefully you'll get a chance to talk with some of the people that really did start the group and, and listening to the really intense stories that they have about the challenges of starting, you know, a group, starting a gay chorus 
in Greensboro in the 90s, um, there's a lot of value to that history. Um, and so it'll take a lot of thought to decide. But the answer to your question is, absolutely anybody can come, anybody can join. Um, the one stipulation is you have to be able to, uh, you have to be able to carry a tune. Uh, if you can carry a tune, we can, we can work with you. And I'll say in the six years that I've been the artistic director, we have only had to ask one person to change the way that they participate. We never, we never, we never send them away. Um, but we do have what we sometimes refer to as a fifth section. That's kind of a, a term that some of the choruses use mm -hmm. for the people that help with everything else. Okay. So that's all. I've only had to have that conversation one time. <laughs> that's a hard conversation to have. But, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, so I would imagine for someone joining the chorus, especially in the past, that would have been a coming out mm -hmm. opportunity for them. Um, can you speak to that with about some of your members and um, how how that has been how that has happened with some of your chorus members? Absolutely. So, generally, um, coming out in terms of sexuality is not something that we do as much, and that's not a, that's something I feel like we're involved in our members' lives as much. Mm -hmm. um, although we've had a few with challenges. Um, so a previous um, leadership member actually uh, could not have his name listed on any of our materials um, because he was worried about work. Um, so that was always that was always a big challenge. But in general, we don't function in that way as much for people's sexuality. Um, but I was really excited about three years ago, one of our uh, men's chorus singers actually got up in front of the group and uh, let everybody know that she was going to begin the transition to living life as a trans woman um, and had this beautiful conversation with everyone about how it had actually been the love and support of the group that allowed her to feel comfortable finally making uh, that transition. And she's actually the assistant director of our small group now. Uh -huh. um, so, and just, you know, living her best life and and doing that. So um, it has definitely become, it is a space where people who may not feel comfortable in a wide range of ways. Um, oh, here's another interesting one, actually. See, it's, it's because gay and lesbian has just been relatively well received, generally. And Greensboro has always been a super liberal place. I mean, you know, your, it was your presentation on the history of UNCG was phenomenal, by the way. Thank you. Um, I still like quote it <laughs> liberally when I'm having conversations <laughs> with you. people. Um, but because the area has always been relatively progressive, that is not as much. But there are a constellation of other identities of people who still feel very isolated and unable to share. So in the women's chorus, we have a huge uh, population of bisexual people who continue to tell me how frustrated they feel about lack of representation, um, even within our organization. And so that's something that we work on. Um, we have several asexual people who feel challenged because they don't feel like they can even explain, they can't even explain that to people. People just don't understand. Um, we have members of the BDSM community who don't feel like they can share those things. So creating a space where all of those people feel comfortable, um, where all of those people feel like they can share that detail about themselves with those around them and it's not going to be judged. Um, that I think is where our work is really principally now. So we will never abandon, we'll never give up our core identity as working on behalf of gay and lesbian people but now we work a lot more in a wider range of identities than just, you know, cisgender gay, cisgender lesbian. Okay. So. Um, and I'm going to attempt to articulate this as best I can, but mm -hmm. this goes to the why, why gay courses, courses exist, why you do what you do. Can you speak to the experience of leading a chorus, a gay chorus, so a marginalized group um, 
in a you know in songs of identity mm -hmm. uh, in a positive crowd being able to do that in a public space yeah. and the importance of that yeah so you know your your question has actually framed it perfectly because that's exactly the point so performances generally can be perceived and are perceived as non-threatening as fun typically as entertainment as something to be enjoyed um, and so in that way using performance especially choral performance by you know choral performances by gay and lesbian people are just what you said they're an opportunity to present a positive image of people uh, that fully incorporates their identity you know one of the things for gay and lesbian people especially white gay and lesbian people um, is that passing has always been relatively easy um, for many not for everybody but for many people um, and so that visible representation isn't always there the way it is for other groups particularly you know I'm thinking like people of color um, and so simply having you know when a lot of the uh, courses started a lot of the courses actually have the word gay in their name um, or gay and lesbian in their name um, and that was a really big deal that was that representation was so vital to simply acknowledge that aspect of the identity um, people love to come and see the shows they love what it represents um, and it is a lot of fun and it does provide people who may not have as much exposure to the community with a little glimpse of you know sort of the the fun and entertaining but also but also heartfelt and we do a lot of music that's very 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 touching um choral music like all music but, but especially people singing together it's really emotional. I mean, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of, you know, I, I do find myself getting caught up a lot of times as we're, as we're, as we're working because of the intensity of the feeling that we're conveying. And so I think to combine that public recognition of LGBTQ identity, that public recognition of identity with this deep, earnest, honest sharing of emotion, I think allows people that are not familiar with those communities um, an opportunity to start to develop empathy. I think that's really maybe what it comes down to, is allowing people to develop a sense of empathy for other people who are just emotional beings, just like they are, who have feelings just like they do, um, and that maybe they've never considered it in that way. Um, so that's another thing is we try not to only limit ourselves to our formal concerts because formal concerts are a circumstance where, um, you know, you're only going to be able to speak to the people that walk in your door. Um, so we do try to get out as much as we can. Um, we sing at political rallies. We sing, uh, at the pride parades. We sing at, um, sometimes on the street. Um, we held a, uh, we, we sang, we did a protest. Um, after the passage of HB2 a few years ago. Um, just trying to get into the community, to places. We sing at the Winter Walk every year. To re basically return to our roots, I guess, and to find those places where the message hasn't been, been heard yet. Mm -hmm. You know, we're here, we're queer, and we're a lot of fun, come watch our show. Like, <laughs> 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 Have you ever had any negative pushback? Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, let's think, in my experience, so my experiences of ne negative pushback have in general been what I might call the professional anti-gay protesters. There's this set of like six people, and it's always the same six people who show up at the pride parades and protest. They're always there. I wish I knew you know, where they were drawing their salary, because clearly someone is paying them to be there, because it's always the same six people. Um, so we, we deal with, with that. Um, 
We did have a few protesters one year when Alamance County first started theirs. They were doing it out of the train station in Burlington. They had a few more protesters. They actually had some that I think were locals. Um, But then we went and we sang, and then they went away. So, I mean, that's positive. Um, There was some, actually, for a different reason, there was some some challenges brought up when I, when, when we started the women's chorus, when I helped founding the women's chorus, um, there was definitely some, some pushback on social media um, about what it meant for a women's group to be led by a man. Um, what that person didn't know or those people didn't know was the immense amount of work that went into correctly structuring our organization um, so that my gender was actually not as relevant in, in the process. So they didn't understand that behind the scenes there was a lot of discussion about that problem mm-hmm. and how to correctly neg- navigate that. Um, but that was something that we heard about. Thankfully, I've got people in my corner that, you know, that dealt with that. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't about the group. It was literally just about, about me. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that was fine. These days, not so much. And it's funny, too, because when we do the concerts, my uh, older members, um, some of whom, you know, we've got founding members still there. I've got members who had sung with other gay choruses even before this group was started. And they love to tell the stories. I love to hear the stories, too, um, about singing in these choruses in the 90s. And they would have protesters at their shows every time every single time they'd have a show they'd have protesters we don't need more I guess that's progress <laughs> so what are some of the venues you've had your shows at we have been everywhere um, we have performed in a lot of churches Congregational United Church of Christ um, on Radiance Drive has been a tremendously supportive organization uh, for our chorus it was actually the original home of the chorus. Um, they did their rehearsals and their concerts there. When I first started with the group, they had moved away from that space. Um, we were performing at the time at the Greensboro Day School and at um, the at UNCSA, um, North Carolina School of the Arts mm-hmm. in Winston-Salem at one of their halls there. And we've done both as well. The Sloan Theater at Greensboro Day is an extraordinary space. Um, it's just way too big. Um, we tend to, unfortunately, we, we have difficulty. So we, we do a lot of concerts. We do one in Greensboro. We do one in Winston. We do one in High Point. And now we do one in Burlington, too. And what that's meant is it does kind of dilute our audience a little bit. We, don't, we just don't get as many people at one show. Um, So Sloan Theater, for example, at Greensboro Day, seats 800. Well, we only only could get 200 people there. Um, So I actually moved us back to Congregational for a while. And it was great. I love that space. It sings so well in there. But then we started working with the Women's Chorus, and now we have too many people to be on the stage in the front there. So um, it's been tricky. We've performed at... um, Oh, the, I forget the name of it, actually. The Methodist, the big Methodist church on Holden Road. Um, that's a... Uh, is it Christ United Methodist, I think? No. I forget. Great space. Um, we've performed in the Van Dyke space, which is in the Cultural Center. Um, we've used schools in the area. Um, Parkland High School in mm-hmm. um, Winston-Salem is one that we get to a lot. Um, in High Point, we've performed in a couple of different places. Centennial Station is actually kind of a fun place. It's a little, uh, it's like a cabaret mm-hmm. space. Uh, it's a fun, yeah, fun location. Um, and they've got a bar. We've always noticed wherever there's a bar, the audience seems to have a better time. <laughs> so, <laughs> but... Um, have you ever done any collaborative ventures with other um, gay choruses? Yes. Um, let me think up to this point, because actually we're right in the middle of one right now, which I'm really excited about. Let me think about before. So about four years ago, was it was it 2015? 
2013, maybe that was, yeah, about four years ago, um, the Triangle Game Men's Chorus wanted to do a, a collaborative show, so we did. Um, and it was pretty easy. Well, in circumstances like that, we really just do one choir sings a few songs, another choir sings a few songs, and then we pick like two or three to sing together. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's usually pretty How do you handle the pretty conducting? Easy. Um, I have never had an ego as far as the actual, like, doing the thing. Um, probably because I was told early on, like, you're not good at this. Um, <laughs> so when it comes to, like, the group conducting, I'm always happy to let somebody else do it unless they ask me. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we just, you know, the conductor conducts their own group. Um, but, yeah, when it comes to the group stuff, like, I get to conduct enough. If somebody else wants to conduct that's fine. We just did actually a really cool um, collaboration. Was it about four weeks, three, three weeks ago? Three weeks ago. Um, it was a, a production for Black History Month where um, the men's chorus and the women's chorus and the common woman chorus, which is um, a gala chorus from Durham, North Carolina, um, although they are triangle wide, and Voices of God's Children, which is a, a gospel. Uh, choir from Winston Salem, uh, we all got together and did a big show like that. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, one chorus sang, then another chorus, then another chorus, then another chorus. And then at the end, we put everybody together. Uh, so, and actually, in that case, I was really happy. Deborah Daniels, who um, conducts that group, you know, she, she was like, Well, what do you want to do? I was like, Honey, you conduct everything. <laughs> she sends me an email afterwards. She's like, That was the most fun. I will remember that. Forever. There's something amazing about having a hundred people on stage yeah. to conduct. So, um, this spring we're working on a project called Quiet No More, which is a commissioned work. It's a brand new, I, I want to say like quasi oratorio. It's just because it's hard to say kind of what it is. It's a performance piece um, that was commissioned by the LA Gay Men's Chorus and the New York City Gay Men's Chorus um, in affiliation with like like 20 something co-commissioning choruses and it's a piece in honor of this and in celebrating the 50th anniversary of Stonewall and it's a big it's a, it's when we finally got the score it's like 139 pages this thing is massive um but so so in order to pull that off um, I immediately got in touch with Common Woman in Durham and the Triangle Game Men's Chorus. And so they're actually going to come and sing with us, uh, and then we'll go and sing with them on their performance. Uh, so that's coming up in May. Uh, and likewise, we'll be really... That'll be... There's something about having 100 people on stage. It's going to be tremendous. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to do those things more, actually. Mm -hmm. We're trying to do those things more. Um, when I first started... They had not done a lot of collaborating. And in general, North Carolina tends to be, I don't know, my experience has been people tend to stick close to home. Um, and so collaborating has been a stretch to ask people to step outside of their you know, comfort zone a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think most of my people would just, my Winston-Salem people frequently complain about having to come to Greensboro for rehearsal. Why can't we have a rehearsal in Winston-Salem? It is 20 minutes. <laughs> it is 20 minutes away. It is not a big deal. Uh, so we're trying. Um, so the other difference there is that also we're not going to do our multiple sort of satellite performances, um, but we are renting the Carolina Theater here in Greensboro. We're just going to do one show. Mm -hmm. So we'll check back in in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. and we yeah. can cross our fingers that it was a tremendous success. I will, I will be there. <laughs> so you're... you're just you're doing all of this and you're also finishing up your your phd mm -hmm. and what is your dissertation on so i had mentioned before that i'm just fascinated by the fact that these people spend so much time and so much money and early on in my work as a as a as a baby phd student i was taking an early an introductory research class and they wanted people to one of our assignments was to make an annotated bibliography. And I think at that point, like, it kind of didn't matter what it was on. Um, and I had not really been in research literature in a long time. So I don't even know why I started down the path, but like, I started noticing these, 
this trend in the literature of what's called factors of motivation. Um, it started back in the 60s, and um, it's this idea of motivation as a science, meaning can we actually determine what specifically encourages people to do a behavior? Um, and obviously in something complicated like participating in an ensemble, it's hard to sort of pin down, but there are some interesting techniques for doing it. So I read all this stuff and then I sort of started, when I was digesting it, when I was processing it myself, see all the existing literature that works in this is about, I hate this, mainstream choruses, so non-identity related choruses, choruses that would you might just call a community chorus. Um, the Handel societies and the, you know, um, the choral societies, the master chorales. Um, and in those groups they had found that, you know, some people came to it for music and some people came to it for social reasons. Well, I started thinking, and for gay choruses, we have both of those things, but we also have a lot more things as well. Um, and there's one qualitative study, actually, that was out of New York that did a multiple case study of one gay chorus and one uh, African-American chorus and one Jewish chorus, and then comparing those and their motivations and their sort of experiences. Um, and that one was definitely in line with my thoughts, which is there's some musical and there's some social, but there's other stuff as well. There's political stuff and there's uh, representation, there's community building, there's advocacy. Um, so yeah, so what I want to do is, is factors of participation to, you know, to, for, for, for people to participate in gay choruses, gay and lesbian. I'm, I'm using gala choruses sort of there as an, as an, um, as a reference point because <clears throat> gay and lesbian choruses doesn't really describe us anymore. Um, so I think I'm, I'm going to probably wind up sticking with LGBTQ identity choruses um, because there's a lot of different groups now mm -hmm. um, with different types of identities. But um, yeah, and I want to do a survey uh, because there's been a fair amount. This is the other thing I thought was interesting is since my master's degree, there's been a fair amount of qualitative work with groups like this, mm -hmm. but there's not been, there's been almost no quantitative work. Um, and in a world where a lot of policy is determined by numbers, um, I think that there's definitely value in, in finding that out. So um, I've been working on this survey where it asks for a lot of information from people. Um, it starts with musical background. We know that some people are drawn to participate in groups because that's just what they do. You know, they've been in ensembles for a long time. They love music. So that's one reason. Um, I asked some questions about people socializing. I'd gone down to New Orleans and done some preliminary work with the New Orleans Gay Men's Chorus about their experiences. And I, so quickly, one of the most interesting things that came up actually was food. That a lot of people like going to choir because they eat well, which I just thought was such an interesting thing. Um, at the end of the whole process, what, what, what does this all mean? I really would love for us as artistic directors, executive directors, um, boards of these organizations. You know, I'd mentioned before that our, our men's chorus has sort of been struggling. I believe in these organizations. I believe in my choirs. I think that we have the power. I don't just believe. I know. I see it happen to change people's lives, people in our audiences and people in our ensembles. I've seen it change people's lives, so I believe in it. Um, but we need to do the best that we can in terms of establishing programming and policies and procedures uh, to, mo to, to best support and best foster what is going to grow these ensembles, or at the very least sustain them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'd like to come up with some, you know, if we know why people are there, then we can better facilitate, we can better support um, getting them in the door and then keeping them there. Because mm -hmm. I know it's good for them. <laughs> I know it's good for them. 
Can you give some examples of the transformative experiences you've witnessed? Absolutely. So, and this is a little bit hard to set up. So, um, all right, we had done this performance we back in January when we were planning, or maybe it was December. It doesn't matter. Um, we we were already planning to do this collaborative project with Voices of God's Children, which is the gospel group from Winston Salem, and that was going to be happening the last weekend in February. The next weekend, which was, I guess, just last weekend? Yeah, it was just this past weekend. Um, UNC Pembroke, Sarah Busman, who's one of the flute faculty members there, was doing a project called the Darkwater Women in Music Festival. And I really wanted to do that. I really strongly feel like we need to be represented at these academic things. It's important. Having our voice in that world is just as important as, as anything else. So I signed us up. Actually, I found out they had had 40 uh, performer submissions. They picked three, of which we were one. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. So, so we get there. The conference didn't have a lot of people. This was their first year. Their first year they ever did it. They had, I think, 30 people at the conference, um, which is not bad, actually. Um, but I have 40 people in my ensemble. Well, so we get, we get to the concert, and there's like five or six people there. Well, we, so we've done this, these two concerts back to back. Let me go back there. I can't teach my people brand new music <laughs> five days <laughs> later. They just don't learn. People don't learn choir music that fast. So we needed music that we could do for both. So if we're looking at music for Black History Month and we're looking at music for a women's music festival, why don't we do music by black women? Um, and it turned out to be amazing. Now, we had to do a lot of work to make this thing successful because we're a majority white chorus. Like, on the one hand, we almost don't have the right to be doing this music like, we can't just pick it up and it, it's not ours to do. So what we did was we started these conversations and we um, actually talked to Deborah Daniels, who works with the Gospel Chorus in Winston-Salem. We had her come and help us uh, during rehearsal. We had a lot of conversations about interactions of meaning making. We do have some um, women of color in our organization, and they were very generous to share their own perspectives. And in some cases, in ways I didn't even anticipate, one of our newest members um, got up in rehearsal one day and she was like, I just want y'all to know we're doing the storm. It's, it's called The Storm is Passing Over. Um, it's, a, it's an arrangement by Bar Barbara Baker, but it's an old, it's a gospel tune from like the early part of the 20th century. And she gets up and I, I have no idea. She's, she's a character. I love this woman. And she gets up and she goes, I just want y'all to know that I didn't know if I wanted to be in this group. But this song, see, I used to have a music group when I was growing up with my, with my family. We had this, me and my, little, my brothers and my sisters. And this was our favorite song. She said, and when, when y'all started, when we were going to sing this song, she's like, I knew this was the place for me. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. This idea of, of being able to share. So then, so we do all of this work. And I feel really good. And we've got this script that we've written to take to this conference to really say, like, you know, like, yes, we understand. We are standing up in front of you as a bunch of mostly white people singing and, you know, making music by black women. And we want to make this a celebration. And we don't want this to be an appropriation and, you know, all of these things. And I noticed throughout the process there were a few scholars there, like professor level scholars. The majority of the people that were in the audience though were undergraduates and they tended to be, we were in a kind of a weird space where they had set up some chairs, some folding chairs, but then there were sort of like high top tables. And I noticed the undergrads were sitting mostly around the high top tables, but slowly but surely, as we continued, the undergrads tended to be for the most part um, students of color as well. Slowly but surely they were like, drifting up and actually coming to sit in the audience by the end of it oh they were just enamored they just they, they thought we did a good job which made me really happy 
And then they're like, oh, we're coming to your show in May. Oh, we've got to come. And, which is funny because their graduation is actually May 4th, which is when our show is going to be. They're planning at the, right now to like finish graduation, get in a van, and come. Because here was the other part. Not only were they, you know, I think that they on the surface saw us doing music that resonated for them, and so they were drawn to that. But then you take that next step. It also turns out several of these were queer women who thought this, they, there's, we are a group that represents one identity that they have, but also is willing to deal with a different identity that they have, and, and they can express both of those things, because for many of them, I think they feel conflicted. Um, you know, intersectionality is, is, is tough for everybody. Um, so yeah, and, and we had that conversation as our choir too, because there we were, we were 40 people on stage doing a show for 15 people in the audience, but we changed lives that day. We didn't really care. We had a great time. We had an amazing performance. The performance was fantastic. And we changed a few people's lives that day. That's what matters. Well, that's an amazing story. Um, so I'd love this interview to go on forever. Um, I probably could. <laughs> I know. Is there anything we haven't covered that you want to cover? Oh, goodness. Um, well, you had mentioned about other gay and lesbian choruses. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just say, you know, the, there's, there is beginning to be a shift, a big shift, in choral music in general. And I am really excited. So I'd love the opportunity to just get this on the record because I think we're going to see a big change in the next 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. And that's that people are no longer only interested, and I mean across the board, I mean everybody, are no longer interested in simply going to an organization to validate or you know, acknowledge or pay tribute to the values of the organization. They're coming to organizations for their own values. And so what we're seeing is that choruses that only have the value of the highest artistic excellence, that's their only, that's the only thing that they focus on, people just aren't really that into that anymore. Um, you can turn on, and I think this is part of it, you can turn on the radio and hear the best choirs in the world 24-7. That's no longer, you know, what people are looking for. People are looking for places that feed their soul, um, to use a cliche. Um, and gay and lesbian choruses, because of where we come from, are uniquely positioned to do that. Um, there's also a lot of aspects of, again, intersectional identity that more traditional choruses, more, you know, mainstream choruses, have never grappled with. And so, again, you know, gay and lesbian courses are uniquely positioned to have these conversations. So, whereas traditionally, gala choruses have not really participated in things like uh, ACDA or, you know, Chorus America, we have been in those spaces, but we've sort of kept to ourselves. Um, that's not going to be the case anymore. Um, I'm actually on the board for NCCA, ACDA now. They recruited me specifically for my skill sets in gender identity, um, you know, things like that. Uh, we've, we're presenting at the national, um, one of my colleagues presented at the National ACDA conference this past weekend. Um, we had a booth there, Gala Courses did. Um, it's a movement. It really, it, and that is the way we talk about it. This is not just an organization. It's not just a group of organizations. It is a movement. It is a movement to allow everyone a place to sing freely. And sing there doesn't just mean to make sound. It means to express themselves, to be who they are. Um, and that change in values has a change in the way we perceive music. Completely changes. So let me tell you another quick story. It was at the, the gala has several festivals. Um, the big one is every four years. They've been doing it since, oh gosh, I'll have to check your date, but it's like, it's either 82 or 84 was the first one. They had 16 gay choruses. They had like almost, they had several hundred people show up to the first one. 
Well, now, you know, when we go in 2020, there will be 8,000 singers there. And that's a small subset of the 20,000 people who sing in these groups every week, you know, throughout, throughout the year. On the off years, so that happens every four years. On the off years, they've started this leadership symposium, which is more or less a professional conference for those of us that are in charge, the artistic directors, board uh, members, um, section leaders, things like that. And in that weekend, they do the normal things. They do session presentations. And I did five session presentations this last time. It was too much. Um, and then they also do concerts. And this time we were in Tucson, Arizona. So Arizona actually has many gay choruses. Um, they've got five or six. I mean, North Carolina, by the way, actually does have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have seven. So, but um, anyway, they had gotten all the Arizona choruses together. And like I shared before, they did a concert where everybody sang a couple of things, but then at the end, they had all learned a couple of pieces together. Well, the stage was not big enough to hold the 300 people, so they wrapped all the way around the audience. A new colleague, who is actually a straight white man, which is interesting, we have more straight white men conductors like this year than ever before. <laughs> So, hey, we're happy. We're happy to have allies. It's always good. Um, so, new conductor of a chorus in the Midwest, straight white man. Um, it was only his second year. He'd never been to a festival performance before. We're sitting there and we're listening, and they're singing, I don't want to remember what it was. I think it was This Is Me, the one from Greatest Showman. And again, they're, they're, they're circled all the way around the audience, and we're all just crying like babies. It's just, it's so moving. It, it's, it's just, it is just an incredible experience to have. We get done. And he's sitting next to another one of my colleagues who's a professor in uh, another university around here. And I just hear him go, what just happened? That's what he says. He goes, you know, it wasn't, he's, he's a traditional university trained choral conductor, right? everything has to sound like this and look like this and that's we were all very rigorously trained in our degrees to have very specific expectations of what the music making should sound like so, she, so he goes what just happened like it wasn't perfect like they had there was they were a little pitchy at times and it wasn't it was it wasn't always together he goes but i was crying anyway he's like that didn't it didn't matter that it wasn't Perfect. And I couldn't stop myself. I just turned around to him and I was like, welcome to a different set of values. You know? And it's hard because when we have these conversations with people outside of our organization, sometimes they hear that as, right, there's only so much. So like, oh, if you're valuing these things, then, oh, you're just not as worried about musical excellence. That is blatantly untrue. You actually can do both things at the same time. Um, and that's, I think, the big message. So the, the big takeaway here is, I think that's the message that Gala Courses has for the rest of the world, which is musical excellence is an incredibly good, it is, is an important value in choral music. It's an important goal, um, but it cannot be the only one. Um, and I hope that my research actually shows that as well. You know, it's an, it's an admirable thing to... Uh, to, 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 to shoot for um, but it's not the only reason that people are in our organizations so well thank you so much for speaking with us sure. about with the part of the community project it's been your work's been just amazing and I really appreciate the time you've taken it's a pleasure